Well, I was, an, I was an undergraduate at the University of New Orleans. They had recently established a program in computer science. They had worked a long time to get one. There was a student chapter of the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery there, and the student chapter with its advisor, you know, faculty advisor, we'd always try to get uh, interesting speakers to come and, and talk to, to, to the students. She was Captain Hopper at the time, was, was available as a speaker. And of course, the students, most of us, didn't even know who she was at the time. But some of the faculty said, oh, no, 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 you want to you wanna hear Grace Murray Hopper. An arrangement was made, and she came. So the student chapter had to arrange to get a car and all like that. And it just so happened at the time, everybody in the student chapter of the ACM had really terrible cars. <laughs> they were student cars. Yeah. I happened to have access to a much nicer car. It wasn't my car, uh, somebody else's car, but I had access to a much nicer car than, than anybody else. So I got, uh, they said I, I volunteered uh, to be the chauffeur and, uh, you know, shuttle her around anywhere she needed to go. I had to be at, uh, you know, at her call. Yeah. And that's how I came to, to meet her, uh, was just being her driver. I was, I was terrified of being late. I got, to the, I got to the airport really early, you know, so I was right there on time. She, she was still in the Navy at that time, I believe. That was the early 80s, so she hadn't, she hadn't retired for the nth time. She was retired, call back, retired, call back, yeah. and then finally retired. And so she was in her uniform, and uh, so as we were driving, uh, I just happened to ask her, you know, what was it like, you know, being a, being a woman in the Navy, you know, all the men in my family have all been either the Navy or the Marine Corps. And uh, I was just curious, what was it like being a woman in the Navy? And uh, she laughed, <laughs> you know, laughed and, and said, well, she hadn't noticed any particular advantages or disadvantages of being a woman in the Navy. She said it more mattered what you did rather than what you were. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's stuck with me, you know, kind of an amusing observation for somebody at that time. Yeah. Considering that uh, she had been in the Navy since uh, the World War II. <laughs> she talked about that for a moment. As soon as uh, World War II had uh, threatened and started, she tried to get into the Navy and they wouldn't take her. They, they said uh, they said she was too old, all right, she was too slender, and she was too short. Okay. And uh, also, she was too valuable teaching mathematics. She had a PhD in mathematics from Yale, and at the time she was teaching at Vassar, and they said she was too valuable teaching. You know, so she kept trying, kept trying, and uh, eventually she took a leave of absence from Vassar and joined the Naval, she told me she joined the Naval Reserve, and that's how she finally got into the Navy. She was, she was terribly easy to talk to. You know, she never, you know, she was not overbearing. She was, you know, didn't, it didn't ever seem like she was trying to impress anyone. But, you know, even if somebody asked her, you know, we were undergraduates, you know, so I assume we asked her lots of idiotic questions. Uh, but uh, she was patient, you know, she'd answer, answer any question that you wanted to ask her. And uh, the truly really interesting thing is she, she took her time about answering and, and, was very interested to see that you understood the answer. And you weren't just saying, uh huh, uh huh. Somebody had actually done some background research and uh, had found out that uh, hilariously, when the, uh, the Data Processing Management Association instituted their Man of the Year Award back in the 60s at some point, the first person they gave it to was Grace Murray Hopper. <laughs> and someone said, well, well, so how do, you, how do you feel being named, you know, the man of the year? You know, and, and she laughed at that. You know, she said, well, it just, it just goes to show you that when you create an award, you better be careful when you name it because you're never sure to whom you're going to give it. <laughs> so uh, she didn't seem offended by that at all. She thought it was, it was pretty humorous. She said, no, you know, don't, don't be worried about that. You know, the important thing is that your achievements are recognized even if they don't know how to, to name it. She wasn't presenting any particular work 
that she was in the process of doing at that time, but rather encouraging students to take a more definite attitude going forward. It's something very important that, uh, that she talked about, which was how it was necessary when considering problems to not necessarily be bound by convention. You know, when, you're in the, when you're in the reserve or whatever and you're going through the officer training and there's a bunch of uh, planning type exercises and stuff like that that they do. And one in particular that she talked about was uh, fueling tankers, okay? uh, where there was a, you know, a, a problem that would come up where you would have a fueling depot you know, and tankers would have to come in and get refueled and organizing them to do that was always difficult because the, uh, it was very, very hard to maneuver them in, get, in, get them right up to the pier, get the hoses attached and stuff like that. And you couldn't do anything else with any of the other tankers until that one was done because there's no space, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she said, well, when they presented the problem to her, you know, it's like, consider this as a problem. Uh, the first thing that occurred to her after thinking about it for a moment was, why not put all of the tankers just next to each other? Okay? And maybe you can't put more than one hang tanker right next to the pier, but you can put one next to the pier, and you can put one next to that one, and one next to that one, and one next to that one, and you run the hoses just from tanker to tanker, because the pumps could actually pump much faster than you, you, know, you, you would think. And so it's like, all right, well, the, the onshore pumps could start pumping to fill the first tanker. And then the first tanker would be filling the second tanker. And the second tanker would be filling the third tanker. Just on and on and on. Yeah. And you would be effectively filling them almost in parallel as opposed to serially. And as a solution, she said, well, you know, since I hadn't been in the Navy before, you know, I wasn't bound by the convention that that's not the way we do it around here. And so it's like, well, why not? Okay. And it was a very interesting solution. You know, and uh, she encouraged people to not be bound by convention. You know, don't, don't think we have to do it that way simply because it's always been done that way. When she was in the Navy, after she, after she finished with the basic training you know, that officers go through, got commissioned as a Lieutenant JG, she ended up at Harvard and was working with Howard Aiken on the uh, Aiken Mark I, Mark II, whatever computers at, at Harvard. And the very interesting thing there, of course, is uh, that's where the very famous picture of the bug came from. Back in the 40s when she was still there, uh, one of the, uh, well, the, the project was run by the Navy. And so you had Navy personnel as officers of the watch, so to speak, over the computer because it was doing Navy computations and such like that. So it was a, it was a military project. And uh, you have a log book where everything that happens. And they were running tests one day and had problems. And after a dutiful investigation, they found that an actual moth had gotten into the machinery and was between the contacts of a particular rate relay in a particular bank in a particular section of the computer. And uh, so they pulled it out and taped it to the logbook and said, you know, first actual case of a bug being found in a program. But uh, after working uh, there, she, uh, she, actually, she actually told us she had turned down a full professorship at Vassar in mathematics just to stay on the naval research team at Harvard. <laughs> So uh, she was very intent on her Navy uh, career. And uh, after she had spent time uh, there, she moved into industry, finally, uh, and spent decades in industry, but kept getting recalled for active duty. You know, she had got retired from the Navy, you know, discharged from the Navy at the end of World War II uh, because she was too old. Uh, she actually did that, too old. <laughs> but they recalled her, like, shortly thereafter, and uh, came back. She stayed for, you know, many years then, and got retired again, and was called back. 
and uh, ultimately she uh, she retired from the Navy at the absolute mandatory time. Uh, she was uh, I think she was almost 80 years old at that time. Uh, I don't remember exactly. I think she was almost 80 years old. She finally retired from the Navy, but uh, by that point she was uh, rear admiral lower half. Uh, when she wanted uh, programming languages to be more user-friendly, more user-oriented, uh, English-like as opposed to mathematical or machine language type. And that ultimately uh, ended up with the, uh, the COBOL, the COBOL work that, that was done. We still uh, have the effect of that today since COBOL still, as far as I know, underlies the overall majority of the financial infrastructure on this planet. <laughs> uh, there's just too much of it to replace. Uh, but COBOL is still there. You know, that was, uh, she felt a major achievement. So when she had been uh, recalled to the Navy again, uh, she actually spent quite a bit of time on standardization, testing, making sure COBOL, uh, COBOL installations were correct. You know, so testing of installations, standardizing installations, making sure all that worked okay. But she was a big advocate, as I say, of getting away from centralized, you know, computers that were, that were just locked away from people. She wanted distributed computing. And at the time, you know, they didn't have the vocabulary that we have now for describing it. But if you look back and see what she was talking about, she was effectively describing what the internet should be today, you know, in a different, a different set of terminology, but you know, complete distribution of information and accessible to anybody with a connected, you know, she called them terminals, but a connected terminal, mm -hmm. just accessible to anyone, you know, but distributed, not controlled by any central source. I can tell you, after talking to her, you know, and just seeing how she answered the question, all like that. I don't think that woman was more proud of anything in her life than her service in the Navy. And the advantage of continuing that service and being part of the team that had effectively, you know, if not the first, one of the first computers that you could possibly have access to, I think that just appealed to her so much more than going back to Vassar and teaching mathematics. You know, as much fun as she had. In case you're unfamiliar with it, nanosecond, just a 30 centimeter piece of uh, wire. This is, this is the distance that light travels in a vacuum. <laughs> so this is the maximum distance that electricity can travel in one nanosecond. And uh, she used that in her talks to describe how the size of computers had to shrink if you were gonna make them much faster. You know, the faster you make it, the smaller it has to be. You know, it's because it's clear that if uh, a computation's happening here, it can't possibly affect the computation happening here, accepting that it takes at least a nanosecond for the information to, to travel. And that was really kind of interesting, and someone asked her, well, how did she happen to come up with this particular way of describing it? And she said, Many non-technical senior level people in the military, admirals, generals, whatever, you know, would complain to the technical people, you know, why can't you do something about the delay in satellite communication? All right, because, well, they're non-technical, so they don't know any better. And uh, so she created this as an example to say, well, we can't make it any faster than this. That's a physical limitation. She also had, uh, a coil. She had, uh, this is actually made from fairly heavy duty wire. She used wire wrap wire when she gave them out. Uh, it was like 28 gauge wire. But she had a coil of wire that was 300 meters. And she said, ah, now that's a microsecond. Okay. And so anytime you talk about the limitations of communication, you just have to consider the physical impact of it. And uh, so she did an excellent job. At the time, picoseconds were just a dream at the time she gave the talk to us. And so she didn't do it. But I hear that later she started carrying around uh, little packets of black pepper, and uh, where a grain of black pepper was a picosecond. 
And so I was like, okay, now they're really smart. So, uh, so that was interesting. But uh, one of the things that sticks in my head a great deal from, uh, from Captain Hopper's talk with us was uh, she left us with the comment, do dangerous things. You know, and I, I later heard that a quote had been attributed to her, you know, that ships are safe in a harbor, but that's not what ships are made for. They have to sail, okay, in order to achieve their destiny. Well, she never, she hadn't made up that quote, you know, or whatever. I don't remember it from when she talked to us. But what she did say to us, I clearly remember, was do dangerous things. You know, and some, someone asked her, said, well, what, what do you mean dangerous things? Well, things that you don't know whether you're going to succeed or not. You know, you have to keep reaching for stuff, but you don't know if you're going to succeed. You know, you don't want to stagnate. You want to reach outside. You want to extend your goals. You want to keep going further and further, because otherwise you stagnate. Okay. And, uh, she said, don't, don't stop doing dangerous things. So we all thought that was great. You know? Well, we were undergraduates, so, so we think that's great. Yeah, so.